Let's look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Of course, we've been in it. Ron, I think the reason that Mary was doing better with it as we see them in the story is that she had already had three months and all these midnight talks with, with Elizabeth, who was also having a miracle baby. You know, that was, that was why she was sent there, was to have this conference with her aunt, who was also having a miracle baby. So they had the miracle baby conference. So when they got back, when she got back, she was like, okay, I got this, I'm, I'm down with this now. So anyway, Matthew 1, 18 and 19. And I want to talk about Joseph today, and then I want to parlay that into it, talk about us. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary betrothed, who was betrothed to Joseph, that's important, before they came together, had sex, she was discovered to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to divorce her privately or secretly. Now, there's some things I want you to see, and we'll look at some other places that talk about Joseph. I wanted to, my impression of Joseph, then there's not much said about him. But what is said about him shows him to be a real man. I mean, a man who sacrifices and lets go of what he thought life should be, the way he thought it should go, to be able to receive and accept and, 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 and embrace what God wanted it to be. That's the great journey, not only of men, but of the believer. We're, we're thrust into this world where we buy into the world's idea. You know, the devil's propaganda is amazing. You begin life, at least in our time, with these Disneyland, you know, Hollywood movie ideas about life that says, if you can just get the right stuff and the right person and the right situation, man, this life is just a place of joy. <laughs> Guess what? This life's a war zone. That's reality. And so when you start off thinking that life, if you can just get the right person, the right situation, the right this, the right that, that you're, you can get in the groove when you're programmed with that, and then you run into reality, what happens to you? You get disappointed, don't you? you get disillusioned, you get discouraged. If you're not careful, you go into despair. Then you give up. That's, that's the devil's plan for you. So, Joseph was betrothed. This was legally married in this time in, in Israel, that means they'd already see there was a, there was an, a, a, the initial arrangement was whether from a father to a father or Joseph to Mary's parents, he approached them and said, I'd like to marry your daughter. And then there was a, a, an arrangement that was made that had to do with finances and family and that was looking for compatibility and all that. And then the agreement was made. All right, and once the agreement was made, money was exchanged. Now, he's not selling his daughter, but money was exchanged and a legal contract was signed and they're engaged. Now, that's a legal thing and it takes, and they would wait almost a year, about a year. I'm not sure why, that part of it, but it has to do with prophecy because we're engaged to Christ, we're betrothed to Christ, and we're waiting on Him, right, to return and get us. So that was the image, all right? And we're in this betrothal period where the breaking of betrothal by adultery was punishable by stoning, stoning her to death. Joseph literally could have taken her in front of the court and they could and had her stoned to death. Okay, that's what a vengeful person would do. So gentlemen, when you get disappointed and you get hurt and you're not getting back what you think you should, what is your initial reaction? Are you vengeful? Are you angry? Do you go into self-pity? Do you escape in some way because you can't deal with it? See, 
That's where every man, every male begins life with those kind of reactions. But that, by the time you get to the end of it, you want it to be different reactions, different responses. All right. So Mary's three-month absence, an unbelievable explanation, caused Joseph to believe she was unfaithful. Now, Ron did a great job of explaining that's just common sense. Common sense. But it wasn't spiritual common sense. So, and it says, Joseph was a righteous man. Now, what does that mean? A righteous man. Well, it means a lot of different things, but Matthew, who wrote this book, uses the word dikaios, righteous, 16 times. And every time it either refers to someone who's a believer, who has been imputed the righteousness of Christ, and now is righteous in Christ forever, a saved person, or a mature believer who has the same ideas and standards as God himself. Be ye perfect like God is perfect. That word teleos means mature or righteous. That's the idea. So Joseph was a righteous man. So let's look at a few things about Joseph. First, he was a working tradesman of undetermined age who wanted a traditional marriage and family with a wife who was honorable and faithful. Nothing wrong with that, is there? You know, nothing wrong with that. So he's a, but here's what I want to say to the young men here, especially. He was a working man. He was a provider. I don't think that's, that idea has been passed down to this present generation of people in our economy is that we're to be workers. We're to be providers for our family. You know, the Bible says that a man who does not provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. And that word provide means to, be, to think ahead. You okay, Willie? You need some copies? Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get a price for them. Uh, all right. Secondly, Joseph was a, was a believer in the coming Messiah. You got some copies? All right. Well, you may be... <laughs> I know, man, those are some valuable copies, aren't they? Now, if I was an immature man, I would blame John Dyer for this. Because I asked him if I had enough, and he said, sure, you got enough. So it's, a, it's, good, to have, it's good to have you here today. Our Joseph was a believer in the coming Messiah. Listen, the Old Testament people, they looked forward to the death, burial, and resur resurrection of Christ as it was revealed to them. We look backwards. Prophetic Christianity, historical Christianity. Okay? Simple as that. All right. So, he was also hungry, spiritually focused. How do I know that? He was open to the word of the Lord. As much turmoil as he was in, as much struggle as he was in, as much how he had convinced himself. Here's a question. What do you think Joseph was saying to himself? What was he saying in his head? That's called inner dialogue, by the way. Self-talk is what your thoughts are. If you want to know what your thoughts are, just listen to what you're telling yourself. It's that simple. So Joseph's telling himself, I can't believe she did that. I can't believe she's been unfaithful. I can't believe this. I mean, not Mary. And it was not Mary, was it? So, but he's spiritually focused. He's open to the word of the Lord. When the angel told him, boom, he was ready. He heard it. He wanted to hear it. He wanted it to be true, but he was obedient to it. He was hungry for the truth of God and willing to obey the truth when he understood it. Gentlemen, your whole life, your whole entire life is going to be focused on that one thing. Are you willing to listen to God and hear His Word and let it change you inside so that He is able to pour Himself through you 
and bless everyone in your life. That's a man. You can be a male and be demanding and petty, vengeful, resentful, filled with self-pity because you don't get back what you think you should. Or you can learn to let God fill up your heart so you pour through. He pours through you. That's a man. A man faces the truth. Thirdly, after the baby, after Jesus was born, they obeyed the law. They obeyed. They went to the, he was circumcised on the eighth day as was required. They took him to the temple and presented him as was required. Joseph was an obedient person. He obeyed. If there's one thing in my life that, well, there's not just one thing that challenges me. I better be quiet before I out myself. So, Joseph, fourthly, was alert. Listen, what happened when the angel came again and said, Herod's going to kill the baby? He was alert. He was protective. He, he visualized himself as the protector for, for Mary and Jesus. He was the protector. Look, the guy with the gun comes in. Who's going to stand up and shield everybody else? That's a man. A man gives himself. He sacrifices himself for the good of others. No greater love than this. What is it? That a man should lay down his life for those that he loves. Absolutely. That's a man. See, we want you to be men, not just males. And you want to be a man, not just a male. Not just a, you know, I mean... Unfortunately, you didn't get the good looks like I did, so you know, you're gonna have to struggle with some things, but you know, there's a defense mechanism that says when you claim something that's not really true. Uh, anyway, fifthly, Joseph was a godly father and example, an example of manly giving and stability to his family of sacrifice to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, when, listen to this for a second. Everything they went through, the angel comes and Mary's pregnant. She goes off and confers with Elizabeth, who's having John the Baptist, another miracle baby, and, and he's born, and then Jesus is born. She goes through all of this with Joseph, trying to persuade him. They go, to, they go to Bethlehem. They have the baby in a hut or whatever it was, a stable. They have to put him in a feeding trough. And they go through all of this. They go to the temple and there's Simeon, there's Anna. Two years later, they have to hop up. And, the, and look, the wise men come and give them these, this wealth. A dream, a Herod gets crazy and they have to hop up and go to Egypt. And sometimes later they come back. And Luke tells us that 10 years later, when they left him behind, y'all know that story? Y'all know that story? You know, the family had come to worship in Jerusalem at the Passover. The whole family had gotten together and packed up and were headed back. And they all of a sudden, they're halfway home, they discover, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Well, the mother and father, they're frantic. They go back, it takes them three days. Imagine losing your 12-year-old child for three days and three nights in a big, big city, right? Are you going to be frantic? So finally, they go to the temple and they turn the corner and there he is, sitting pretty as you please, talking to these theologians, asking questions, giving opinions. So Mary, <laughs> Mary's a typical mom. She goes, why have you done this to us? Listen to this. She said, Don't, do you not realize that your father and I have been suffering in agony for three days while seeking you, looking for you? So who's his fa who does Mary say his father is? Now, two things. One, somehow they have forgotten all that they went through. Ten years later, they have forgotten all that. And now she, Mary says, Joseph is your father. Here's the good side of that, though. Joseph was such a good father, such a stable man, a loving, giving man, a sacrificial man. 
that everybody saw him as Jesus' father. He was a sacrificial father. He was a giver. Let's talk about being a man. First of all, God evaluates people individually. God's going to evaluate you based on you, how you deal with your life. And this is so important when it comes to being a man. Males are born, but men are made. You're born a male, but you're, a man is made. And a man is made by choosing to follow the example of other men that come before them. Other men. Now, young men, find someone that's honorable and spiritual and moving properly in their life, and you follow them, emulate them, learn from them. You got some good examples. Human masculinity and, ma and manliness has value, but manliness from, a, from Christian character. One of the things I want to make a distinction of today is the difference between human manliness, even, even divine, what we call divine establishment, common sense, decency, integrity, manliness is very, very different from Christian character formed out of the Word of God through the Holy Spirit. Very, very different. Years and years ago, and not so long ago, I used to get up here and fuss at people. Because I, 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 I was looking at my own life and realizing I'm not doing very well with this. I mean, I can teach it, but I don't live it very well. You know, I mean, I want to be sacrificial, but I'm not. I'm petty, selfish, put myself first. If I don't get what I want in return, then I'm like self-pity and sad, you know, and some shriveled up, you know, escape. I find all these escapes not to deal with my life. But anyway, I used to fuss at people as a preacher. You must do more. You must try harder. You must be more this. You must be more that. You know what that does when I do that? It inspires people to use their human ability, their human effort, their human will, to just try harder. Try harder to be what Christ says you should be that you can't possibly be just by trying harder. This is not about trying harder, guys. This is not about bucking up and being a man. This is about allowing yourself to be changed, supernaturally changed inside of you, surrendering. Joseph surrendered his dream. He surrendered it. <laughs> he didn't want to, but he did. You're going to surrender your dream? Are you, going to, are you going to live in disappointment and disillusion and depression because you didn't get what you wanted? Because you weren't man enough to make it happen. Truth is, the whole idea was a dream that came from the devil or yourself instead of God. God, listen, the life you're living is the life God has allowed you to live right now. It's the life for you. It's God's will for your life. You say, well, I'm not doing the right thing. No, I know. And that's why He's allowing all this stuff to try to point you back in the right direction. But it's not about trying harder. It's not about me fussing at you to try harder. It's about me helping you see the power of God, the truth of God, and how to implement that in your life so that you become someone whom God can pour His heart out through you in love, in giving, in grace. I'm not that. Truthfully. Let me ask Rhonda, I'm not that. I want to be. I'm trying to be. I'm moving, to, <laughs> I'm moving that way. That's all you can do, folks, is move that way. So, Christian character comes from God. You remove self-serving beliefs and replace them with Christ-centered ideas, and then you perfect and habituate these ideas into character. Are you, self, are, are you self-serving when you talk to yourself? Are you talking to yourself about getting more for me? 
Listen, I understand that. This is, this is normal, sinful human behavior. That's where everybody starts. Me. I'm empty. I need to be filled. Here, I don't have God, so I'm going to, let, I'm going to get these people to fill up my heart, to give me their love, to give me their approval. I'm going to get it from people. Can you get it from people? Can't get it from people. But we sure try, don't we? I mean, way down into the end of life, we're still trying to get it from people. Manly, manly men, men who are facing the truth, begin to realize that I can't get that from her. She doesn't have it. Even if she would give it to me, if she could, she doesn't have what I need. Only God has it. That's a hard truth. So, men of Christian character are not humanly tough. Here's another idea. They're not humanly tough. They're weak and dependent on God's power. See, I grew up with John Wayne. I don't know if I can stand like John Wayne. Hey, he never lost. He, he, was all, he, he never gave in, no matter what. That's an image, huh? Well, now I have a different image. It's called Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. He never gave in either. But listen, everything he did was designed to bring other people to God. Here's my question. Am I, the things I'm saying to myself, do they make me choose to edify and build and help and encourage and bring others closer to God? Is the behavior that's coming out of my life in, in edifying my wife and my kids, or am I escaping because I'm disappointed that they're not giving me more for me? That's a core question. That's a core life question. The devil wanted to be independent from God. He didn't want to be a servant anymore. God said, I'm sorry, dude. I mean, I made everything in the universe to, be ser to serve me. The moment you decide to stop serving me, you know what happens? You die spiritually. Boom. When that happened, instead of being humbled, because look, he wasn't get, his plan wasn't working. He wasn't getting the fulfillment that he thought it would give him. Instead of being humbled and going, oh, I have made a mistake. What did he do? He became angry and bitter went into self-pity, began to plan all this crap that we're in now. Sorry for the word crap. My mother was here. She'd get on to me big time. Thirdly, all Christians looking into the mirror of the Word are to compare their behavior with Jesus Christ. Who do you compare yourself with? Young men. With each other. You say, well, I know more than my other fellows. You know, I'm, I've learned more and I'm doing better and I'm number one, blah, blah, blah. No. When you look in the mirror, look at Jesus. Your behavior. What's coming out of you? What's coming out of your soul toward others? What tone do you use? What words do you say? What behaviors are you producing toward other people? Now you take that and you examine it and you, uh, you are alert to it and you watch it happening and you compare it to what? Your father? You know, some other, some, no. To the Lord Jesus Christ. When my words and my tone do not reflect something that edifies other people, then it reveals to me that I am believing and thinking something that is not from God. Does that make sense? Say yes. So how much of you is not from God? Most of you? All of you? A lot of you. A lot of me. It's a transformation, folks. It's a transformation to stop being this guy and being more this guy. You're saved. You're secure. Now let's be this guy. Now how do you do that? You say, well, you try harder. You get yourself in here and you listen and you learn and you grow and you apply this to your life. You 
become faithful to this. These two guys right here will teach you. This guy right here will teach you. There's a guy that will teach you. There's a guy that will teach you. Gifted to do so. There's a guy that will teach you and inspire you. That's God has put here for you to become the man he designed you to be and live out a life that you can't even dream. Now, what are you doing with your life? I mean, I'm talking to me. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your loved ones? How are you acting toward them? How are you treating them? I mean, are you escaping? I mean, I'm an expert at that. Escaping to the television, escaping to my studies. Escaping to the fishing. Bought this little house over here on the lake so I could fish and escape. Now see, fishing is wonderful. If there's two things that will be in heaven, it will be golf and fishing. Yeah. But you can turn anything into an idol and make it your reason for living. And you can turn anything into your source but God. And when it doesn't work for you, it turns you into someone who's a monster. Well, I'm not a monster. No, I'm just, yeah, no, you're just beat. You tried to do things your way. You didn't. Look, and, and, and listen, you didn't really have a choice. When you were born and you were two years old and you said, you know, I don't think I'm going to be a sinner. I'm going to be like Jesus. So when you're in junior high and everybody else is talking about the boys and the girls and this and that, you go, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be righteous. <laughs> right? Is that what you did? Oh, well, that's what I did. Like not just swallowed up all of this worldly stuff about what makes life work and where happiness comes from and still trying to get that stuff out of me and get this stuff in. Being a man, well, let me say this one last thing because this has become my life is trying to be a man. And I'm just describing the Christian growth and Per meaning and purpose is trying to become a man, a Christian man, is are you, are you willing to face what we call baggage in your life? Your, your insecurities, your, your defenses, do you live behind walls? I mean, are you so awkwardly insecure that you can't even relate well? Well, that's me. I don't relate well, really. Now, I love all of you people. I know, hopefully you know that, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not really user friendly. I mean, I want to be. No, I really don't. <laughs> but, uh, but I love you. But I've got so much, I've had so much stuff in the way of me letting Christ through me. It's been me, not Christ. And so to keep from Letting baggage hurt, you know, you withdraw, you build a wall, you live behind it, you know, you leave everybody out there or you blame them that they can't come in here or whatever. Does that make sense to you? You live behind your baggage. You don't deal with it. Christ wants you to face that and remove that and leave that behind. And Paul says, look, he just described his whole life. Everybody says... Philippians 3 says you should not think about your past. Forgetting what's behind and straining forward, right? Forgetting what's behind. The word forgetting there actually means to leave behind. Leaving it behind. He just described his whole life. <laughs> so he hadn't forgotten it. But what it means is to those things that have formed you and hurt you and harmed you and built mechanisms in you and walls and philosophies and ways of thinking about life that are not godly. You should be willing to face that. What else you should be willing to do is face it with one another. With one another. So, that's a whole other story. I thank you for your attention. Uh, I told Ronald I was going to get up here and fussed, but I'm not sure that's what I did.
this is not just about trying harder, guys. It's about letting God transform you. And that can't happen without you being in Bible class and learning everything there is to learn so that you know enough to be able to implement it in your life. This is, you know, when you show up once a month or not at all or every now and then, you're not going to grow. You're not going to become a man. Father, what a great privilege to be part of a church where evangelism is taking place. And I thank you for Willie and his spiritual gift and what you're doing through it. I thank you for a community of young men and women that are open to that, for letting me be part of, letting us be part of this whole dynamic thing that's just beginning to happen that could be the beginning of a whole new groundswell of spiritual life. I pray for my nation, Father. I pray that through through the through the work of God in the lives of our my life and the lives of these young men and women, that we could actually build back the structures and, and the integrity and the common sense so that we could be a place where the gospel could go forth. And I know it does. I pray for the African missions that are going on. I ask you to bless them and open doors there and give us the means to get there with the message. Show us how to do it properly. Father, show, open, the, open up the internet for these people and whatever is required so that old men like me and Rick don't have to fly 40 hours to speak. So that's just a request, Father. Maybe we should fly. I don't know. I love you, Father. I love these young men. I pray that you'll grow them into godly men. We pray all this now in Christ's name. Amen.